all you friendly people that love to talk. <clears throat> Come on in, find a seat. Meg was, uh, reading, Meg was teaching the children the first three questions of a children's catechism that Meg and I were exposed to a number of years ago. We're even sort of bringing our children through that. And there's a reason then that the very first three questions have to do with the Bible. And uh, I want to let you know that we're the kind of church that believes in the what's called the inerrancy of Scripture. We believe that it is true when all the final, when all the evidence is in. What it affirms to be true, we believe it is true. Understood originally, and, and we believe that, that whatever the Bible claims is reality, we believe that's reality. And, the, and so much of our foundation as a church and our foundation as a people of God really depend on how we view this. If this is not true, then we may be tempted to disregard whatever it says whenever it's inconvenient for us. You guys with me? And if it is true, then we have to find a way to conform our thinking and our lives and our experience to what this says, not the other way around. Yes. And we are in a culture that is going down that road, that has diminished the authority of Scripture because many feel and they're finding that the message of Scripture is in competition to their own thinking or their own experience. And we've elevated experience and our own wisdom above, above this, and we've diminished really the role of Scripture. And soon all it becomes is a guidebook and an inspiration of how to get a, give a good life, how to live a good life, instead of being the absolute word of God, our rule, our guidebook for, every, for, for, for living our lives. So everything that it says to be true, we believe that it's true. So even at the foundation of this church uh, last year, we, we, um, our leadership team just, we wanted the priority of scripture and the teaching of scripture to be of the utmost importance. So I'm going to be challenging you every time I'm up here, bring your Bible with you. Have a copy of the Word with you. It's awesome if you got it on your phone. That's, I would prefer that you have this because there's something about just the pages and the ink. And you can like write in and underline and make notes. You can't do it on your iPhone. My kids have tried. It doesn't work right on the screen, right? Um, and if your battery does that, you're stuck. So it's great to have both. But um, let's be a people that bring, bring the Word to church and we study it and we do what it says all right we are in Ezra we are wrapping up a series called the restoration studying the book of Ezra and what it meant for God's people thousands of years ago and what does it mean for us what is God wanting to to teach us about and to show us uh, about being a, a restorationist kind of people that, that partner with God and all he's doing if you missed some of the last three weeks of this, I, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to recap all of it, but I'll kind of paint a little bit of the background of this. Um, the book of Ezra describes the story of God's people coming out of exile in Babylon. Uh, back in the Old Testament, it describes how, how God brought judgment on the people of Israel. Their enemy neighbors came in and destroyed their city and took many of God's people to another country in Babylon and kept them in captivity for 70 years, in exile for 70 years. And the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament describe that return back home, the return to their homeland and how they begin to, to reestablish themselves and be restored as a people of God. So early in the book of Ezra, it talks about the, the, the first wave of people came under a man named Zerubbabel. He brought about 50,000 people with him. At the, at the end of the seven-year exile, he brought about 50,000 people with him, and they began the work of slowly rebuilding their lives. And they began by rebuilding an altar and then the temple. And last week we talked about the opposition that came, and any kind of good work that God calls us to do comes with opposition. It was true then, it was true in the day of Jesus, it's been true all through history, it's true of us today. Any good work that God calls us to do, we're going to face opposition. Out. And last week we kind of looked at that and we started talking about perseverance and finally how God enabled them to have success in spite of that. And the temple was completed and it was standing there. So we're going to be in Ezra uh, beginning in chapter 7. There's a lot of material here to wrap this up because there are uh, 7, 8, 9. There's four more chapters in this book and I kind of went back and forth, you know, trying to, trying to do all of this this week or do I split it up and do it five weeks and I just feel like this is the time to, to end this story. So... There's a lot of sort of stuff I'm going to be throwing at you, you know, and I'm going to do my best to kind of not leave you behind. So bear with me if you have your Bibles. We're going to be in Ezra 
chapter 7. So, last week they had finished the temple. They had finished uh, re resurrecting this thing and getting it up off the ground. And they celebrated with sacrifices. And they celebrated with, uh, with, with the Passover feast. Now we're going to fast forward about 80 years. So our story today with Ezra takes place about 80 years after the temple was completed. And he is going to be bringing another wave of people back with him in our story. He's not bringing 50,000. He's not bringing nearly that many. He's only bringing about 17 or 1,800 with him on this return. And if you remember from the very first week of this, we talked about how um, these different waves, they had different purposes and different things needed to be rebuilt. And the first thing that was rebuilt was the temple itself, was, was the temple itself and the altar. And now Ezra, now that that's done, though, Ezra is going to bring another group of people for another rebuilding work. This time it's not a physical rebuilding. This time it is a spiritual rebuilding. He's going to help rebuild not the temple, but the people. And help restore their identity as unique chosen people of God. So we're going to learn a little bit more about Ezra. But first, let's read a little bit of the, uh, of the word from Ezra chapter 7. It's on the screen here behind me if you don't have your, your Bibles. Ezra chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Merioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Azai, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. Whole lot of sons of in there. Whole lot of names that are hard to pronounce. The most important one is the son of Aaron, the chief priest. That's important. Verse 6. This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which was the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord was upon him. You guys say that with me. The hand of the Lord was upon him. Verse 7. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Verse 8, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. For the gracious hand of his God was upon him. Verse 10, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Let me pray for us, and we're going to get into this. Father, we love your word. We love it, Lord Jesus. We love how you inspired men through history to record down your movements, to record down your revelation, to record down your story of redemption. So, Lord, we believe these words. We believe that they, that they reflect reality and history. And we want not only to read them, we want to understand them and also to be changed by them. Yes. So Lord, we open our hearts to you this morning in Jesus' name. So Ezra tells us that, um, oh, amen. I to say that. <laughs> you guys will have your eyes closed. Like, right, I'm going to say amen. Is that right? Ezra, the Bible tells us he is a priest and a teacher. Those two things are important. He's a priest, and that's the reason that all these names are given. They want to establish that, that Ezra, even though so, much, so many years have passed, is still uh, related in the, in the line of Aaron. Aaron, of course, being the first priest that God ordained. And, and the Bible says that all of Aaron's descendants, only Aaron's descendants, would be, uh, would be ones who would serve in the priesthood. And the Bible makes it clear that Ezra is one of those. He has a genealogy to prove it. He's also a teacher. It says this, it says he was devoted to three things. He was devoted to studying the word, to observing it, in other words, to putting it into practice, and finally to teaching others. Those are three really important things. Unlike the Pharisees, if you think about in Jesus, the Pharisees were really good at one of, maybe one or two of those things. Whatever they, Jesus says, he says, whatever they, the Pharisees, tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. That's Jesus' judgment upon the Ezra's of his day. Jesus looks at the Ezra's of his day and says, these are the ones who they have a whole lot of talk, but they're really not doing it. 
They talk a lot about the law of God, but they're not doing anything about it. And Jesus says, don't be like them. Ezra is that way. Ezra talks the talk, and he walks the walk. And it's for him, it's beyond just intellectual awareness. It's not just studying the scriptures. He has a heart and a mind and a life that are preoccupied with the will of God. He's just, he's consuming that. He wants to study it. What does the word say? What do, what does the, the ancient uh, scriptures talk about the nature of God and the character of God? And what does he want for us? Ezra wants to understand these things, but he also wants to observe them. He also wants to practice the things that God says to practice. He wants to learn to love and obey God as well, not just understand it, but to do it. And finally, he also he's, he's so preoccupied with this that it spills out. He wants to teach other people. Not only do I know it and I'm doing it, I'm sharing it with others and I'm passing that around. So Ezra is a unique character. He's, he's highly educated. He's a teacher, but he's also kind of carries that mantle of evangelism and, and just sort of going out and saying, this is it. And the result of that kind of posture of Ezra is the phrase that we read together. The hand of the Lord was upon him. And we're going to see that phrase six times in this story. As if the writer is going out of his way to say, you guys, Ezra, you need to know there's something unique about him. He wasn't just brilliant. He wasn't just scholarly and devout. Something unique was about him, that everything he did had success. And I would, guys, I would love for that phrase to describe me and you and our church. Wouldn't it be awesome at the end of the day, at the end of history, they could look back and say, King's Church was a church where the hand of God was upon them. Amen. Mm -hmm. And the hand of God is like moving and directing and saying, I want you to go over here. I want you to do this. I want to fight battles for you. I want to stop. I want to hold you back. And the hand of God is sort of moving them around, you know? I want that to describe me and you and our families and our church. The hand of God is upon them. So that, that, that's who Ezra is, and a few things then begin to happen in the story. We're not going to be able to read all of this, so I want to challenge you to kind of go back and look at the story. But the first thing that happens is a re another release um, from the Persian king to this second group of people. And in chapter 7, beginning in verse 11 through verse 28, that long section, the king decrees that Ezra is allowed to return that Ezra is allowed to return and take as many people with him as he wants. So he gives permission, but more than that, he, the king also provides provision for the journey as well. Just like, you know, 80 years ago when, when, when Zerubbabel was going and the king said, sure, not only are you gonna, can you go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make your neighbors pay for the trip. The same thing is happening here. The, the, the king is saying, Ezra, you're, you're free to go. Go and do what God's called you to do. You know, go, go, go and begin to reestablish the people. Anybody that wants to go with you is free to go. And by the way, I want, I want, everybody's going to pitch in to help you do this. And he provides this incredible provision. You know, look at, look at verse 15. It talks about this. This is provision for, for the trip itself. It says, moreover, you are to take with you the silver and the gold that the king and his advisors have freely given to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. So the king himself pitches in all this money and says, Ezra, take this. But he also provides sort of the, this, these, the needs and the provision for the days ahead. Um, jump on, look at verse 21, says this. Oh, by the way, this is interesting. No, verse 21. Now I, King Artaxerxes, order all the treasures of trans-Euphrates to provide with diligence whatever Ezra the priest may ask of you. And he begins to list these things. Goes on, he says, a uh, hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of olive oil, salt without limit. Now stop this, that's kind of interesting, salt without limit. It's like, why, why would he say that? One second. My throat's a little dry this morning. And I begin to think about what, what, what Ezra was going back to do. Of course, what is waiting for him is the temple, but there's something unique about salt in the history of, of uh, of, of the Jewish people. Leviticus 2 says this, and this is a law that Moses would have been familiar with. Leviticus 2, God is giving his law to his people about the sacrifices that they're to offer. And God says this in Leviticus 2, says, in every offering of our grain offering, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all of your offerings, you shall offer salt. 
as if salt is sort of like this symbolic, you know, you know, representation of, of, of the grace of God in covenant. You know, we, we, have this, we have this offering here, this lamb, this whole burnt offering that, that's consumed by fire. But we also, we take the salt and we throw it on that offering as well. And the Bible, and, and God says, every offering that you give, take this measure of grace and throw it on there. Take this measure of salt and throw it on there. Never, don't offer anything without throwing salt on it first. And it's awesome that the king, Artaxerxes, says, by the way, I'm going to give you all this. I want to give you all the salt that you need. It's going to go with you. Unlimited. There's limits to these other things, but salt you can have as much as well. I just thought that was really interesting. So they, they provide all these things that they need for the trip ahead. Verse 8 then talks about that journey home. And he begins to list these. He says, these are the family heads who came up. And he begins to list all the descendants all the way down. These are real people. These are real families. And the writer of this just wants to communicate that this is really happening. And here are the ones who, who devoted themselves to this. And in, eight chapter, in chapter 8, verse 15, talks about their return to Jerusalem. He says this, I assembled them at the canal that flows towards Ahava, and we camped there three days. So he gathers them all together. And, then, and we're not going to read through this. It's a 900-mile journey. It takes about four months for them to get there. But about 100 miles in, they stop for this assembly. And the Bible doesn't exactly tell us why, but there's some clues in here as to, as to what's really happening. Ezra realizes, I think, that he realizes that there are some significant perils in the journey ahead. This is going to be a four-month journey. Not only are we taking these 1,800 people, we are loaded down with treasure. We've got gold, we've got silver, we've got all these things, and by the way, we're not a fighting army. We're a group of men and women and boys and girls, and we're basically making this journey of 900 miles, and there's not a lot of protection. And Ezra realizes that this is going to be a perilous journey, so he stops 100 miles in and begins to pray and fast. I think that's interesting. Ezra knows where the power comes from. He doesn't go back to the king and say, by the way, we need an armed escort. <laughs> this, is what's, this is what's funny. I love, I love how human Ezra is. Skip down to verse 21. I don't think it's behind us, but I'll read it. So there, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. That makes sense. Look at verse 22, though. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies on the road. All right? Ezra confesses this. He says... I was ashamed because we had told the king this. We had told the king, King, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, for his great anger is against all who forsake him. And think about how funny this is. He's, before the journey begins, he's, he's talking to the king, and the king is saying, Ezra, you really want to go? And Ezra says, yeah, we really want to go. I'll get the word out there, and this is our homeland. And the king maybe says something like, okay, it's about, it's about a 900-mile journey. And it's a, that, that, that's a treacherous route. And there are thieves and bandits out there. And Ezra says, ah, oh, don't you worry about it. The hand of God is on us. He's going to protect us the whole way down. And the king maybe says something like, are you sure? And Ezra says, of course I'm sure. This, you know, we are the people of God. We have the protection of God. The king says, okay, go on your way. And now, 100 miles in, Ezra's thinking, oh, shoot. This really is a big deal. It really is a wide open road. And he says that we stopped and I was afraid to go on and I was afraid to ask the king because I had basically talked real, uh, you know, kind of talk smack, talk real big about how God was going to take care of us. And Ezra's like, I'm not going back. You guys ever done that? You ever like sort of put God in a corner? I love it. I love it when we do that. It's, and I, I hear this. I've not done this before, but I hear this about like people that have the gift of healing in evangelism out on the street. You know, guys like guys like Todd White will do things like this, where they will basically go up to somebody and say, you know, God is going to heal you. I, I know they've heard a word about that, you know, but it's like I hear that and I think to myself, you're basically telling these people that they're going to be healed in a moment. And if they don't, that's going to make you look really stupid. and It's probably going to cause their faith in God to diminish. But inevitably they do it and this person is healed because I think that God responds to that kind of faith. Even if it's somewhat misguided, God loves that kind of faith. It's like a little boy or a little girl who stands up in the class and begins to talk about how their dad or their mom can do impossible things. Oh, yeah? 
You know, my dad is so strong that, that he can lift up a car. I saw him do it last weekend. You know, it's like, a, and the kid just believes. He was like, just, you know, just exaggerating everything that, 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 that his dad can do. And I feel like Ezra's kind of in this position, like, okay, I kind of painted myself in the corner. I'm not going back to the king, but I'm not 100% sure. So look at what he does. It says this. He says, so we fasted and petitioned our God about this. Dear Lord, by the way, we made a promise on your behalf. And here we are. We kind of need you to uh, step up and pay the piper. They fasted. They asked God for permission. They asked him for favor now. And it says, he answered their prayer. And then he goes on to describe what he does. He takes, he selects these individual men. He takes the treasure and divides it up among individual men. That's a wise, that's a wise move. In case something happens to one, then all the treasure is not lost. And three more times we see this, that the hand of the Lord was upon him. And finally, at the end of eight, at the end of chapter eight, 57 years after the completion of the temple, Ezra arrives and the people arrive. And by the way, during these 57 years, this is where the book of, the book of Esther takes place. So they arrive now. Verse 35, they arrive and they offer burnt offerings. Verse 9, or chapter 9, rather. When he, when he gets there, though, <coughs> Ezra finds an alarming situation. It's not quite what he was expecting. You ever show up to a place and like you have these sort of expectations of what it's like? You know, ever been on vacation or going to resorts or going to places or family events and you sort of have built this up in your mind, right? And when you get there, it's not that way at all. I think Ezra is facing the same thing. You know, for, 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 for these months, he's so, he's so ready to go. He's not, he's not been, here, um, been here before, you know, and, and it's all these years have passed. And he knows that there's another wave that went before him. Um, and he's been so excited to being with his people, and his feet being on the promised land and seeing the, the temple. But when he arrives, he finds something that's altogether different. The temple is there. Yeah, that's, that's it. There's nothing wrong with the temple, but there's something wrong with the people. Something is out of sync, and it says this in, in chapter 9, verse 1. It says, after these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. And so Ezra arrives and they, they come to him and say, Ezra, this is, this is not a good situation. <clears throat> the people have fallen into sin and fallen into, into wickedness. And not only are they, they doing that, Ezra, the leaders and the priests have sort of been you know, encouraging, encouraging them along in this way. It's a failure across the board. It's a crisis of leadership across the board, neglecting the covenant law of God. Verse 3 says this, When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of, 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 of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. And it's hard to understand this now. We've got, we live very much in a tolerant, pluralistic society. And it's gotten even more so, I would say just in the last two decades, where the supreme value in America is toleration and open-mindedness and diversity. But in the, in the culture of the ancient Near East, especially for the Jewish people, to Ezra, this lax approach to God's covenant law, this is what got them in trouble in the first place. 
You see, way back in Exodus chapter 19, after God had delivered these people and called them to himself, and God comes on this mountain of Sinai and he's beginning to give them this law, God makes this covenant promise with them. He says that out of all the nations on the earth, you, Israel, will be uniquely mine. You will be my treasured possession. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And that was sort of in the DNA of the Jewish people from that time on. They were uniquely set apart by God. And God called them to that kind of covenant faithfulness. And he expected them to walk in covenant faithfulness. And it's that failure to do that. It's that sort of, you know, pluralism and open-mindedness and bringing in other cultures and other gods and other ways of thinking and mixing it with ours. And, you know, we'll worship Yahweh here, but we may worship Molech here. And, and it's a little bit of everything all mixed together. That very sounds familiar to me. I don't know if it sounds familiar to you or not. But this was an absolute violation of the covenant law of God. And this is what lands him in exile in the first place. And Ezra comes back and he says, you've got to be kidding me. We just got this built and we're already living this kind of life. And what's at stake is not, these are, this is not just the ethnic distinctions. This is not just a matter of, you know, let's, not, let's keep our DNA separate, you know. It's not so much of this is a holy race and we can't mix it together. This is about identity for the people of God. They're losing it. And Ezra knows that. So Ezra is faced with this situation. They come back and they tell him that we've, we've mixed all this together and Ezra knows that this is a serious situation because the people are failing to be unique. They're failing to be holy. They're failing to be set apart. And the future of all the covenant promises that God has, including the, 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 the coming of the Messiah, depends on this group of people truly being set apart. So Ezra takes some steps that are necessary. We read this already, chapter, in, in verse 3. He said, he tore his tunic and his cloak, he pulled his beard, his hair out, sat down appalled. And he stays in that position all day long. And all the people are gathering around him and they're saying, okay, we're with you, Ezra. Goes on to record Ezra's prayer and confession in the rest of chapter 9. And he goes and he just begins to confess on behalf of the people. You know, all these things, you know, confessing, Lord, we, we're doing it again. This is what got us in trouble. And in chapter 10 begins this way. He says, while Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children gathered around them. They too wept bitterly. So he's repenting and that catches on and others begin to sense the gravity of the situation and they too begin to have repentant hearts and they bring, they're all standing around just, just repenting and weeping bitterly. Ezra calls them to repentance. He stands up and he says, it's, we, we can't do this anymore. He calls them to repentance and they respond. Look at verse, uh, go to verse 9 in, in, in chapter 10. Within three days, all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem. And on the 20th day of the ninth month, all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. Somebody say, amen. amen. To the rain. Verse 10, then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have been unfaithful, you have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. And he makes a really a tough call, right? And he's... And I know his heart is broken because he's looking out and he's seeing these, these kinsmen of his, these friends and family of his, and he knows that, that they mean well, but he also knows that they have a, an unholy alliance that they have made, and this is contrary to the law of God. And Ezra is torn by this, and he has to make this, he says, you have to separate. You've got to leave your wives, leave the foreign wives. And by the way, this is one of the hard things in Scripture that we as believers have to wrestle with. When God calls us to do things that are profoundly difficult and they don't make sense. He's calling husbands to leave their wives. Why would he do this? Didn't God say that, you know, what, what, what God's put together, let no one separate? Yes. Does God really want to split up families? Does he really want little boys, you know, little girls and boys to not have moms and dads and homes? I thought God was pro-marriage. If I read this, it looks like he's not pro-marriage. 
It looks like he wants to separate, and he's like, you know, very, uh, you know, he's, he's just kind of has this racial superiority thing, like these people are not good enough for you. Cast them away. Of course, we know that's not the heart of God. Even I wrestle with this. Even I look at this and say, God, that's not fair. Why can't you have amnesty? Why can't you just say, okay, from now on, all right, we're going to let you foreign wives stay, but from now on, no more of this. That would be the compassionate thing to do. That's probably what someone like me would do. You know, I, I, I would want to have such grace and such understanding and such compassion that I say, okay, from now, we're, we're not going to do anything about you here, but from now on, no, no. But that kind of understanding doesn't really have a clear picture of the holiness of God. And that's what this is about. That's what all the laws are. You know, those weird laws, you know the weird laws about mixing fabric together, right? Don't mix fabric together. You know, and don't eat this food with this kind of food. And don't mix these two things to, together. And don't, 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 set the, you know, don't marry these kind of people. And you think, what does that have to do with anything? Because what God is trying to do is trying to establish an understanding of his holy character that is so different than anything that the world has ever known. His holy character is absolute. There is no other. There is no other option besides God and his holiness. And God wants to say to the people, you are exclusively mine. No compromise. I will not share your heart with anyone else. He is jealous for their love. He is jealous for their devotion. And God says, separate yourself because you belong entirely to me. And the funny thing is that Jesus doesn't change that message very much, does he? Jesus comes in, these, these people are asking him, you know, like, what's, what's, you know, what's the, what does the law say? What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus doesn't go down on these lists. He says one thing, love the Lord your God as much as you're able to. No, it doesn't say that. He uses the superlatives of all. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength. Every single part of you needs to be fully given over to God. That's the greatest commandment. Yeah. That's what Jesus is pointing to. Jesus is as absolute as the Old Testament is. Yes. You know, and we kind of live in this culture where people point to these soft words of Jesus. You know, don't judge. And, you know, do it to others. Do it to you. That's all true. Jesus does have soft words. But Jesus has hard words as well. The New Testament has hard words as well. Peter's the one who says, be holy because I am holy, says God. The bar is so far up here. Jesus doesn't lower that. Jesus just says, come and stand on my back so that you can measure up. That's what he says. I talked about this ring last week. This is a, this is a ring. It's a, it's a symbol of my love for Megan. Right? She's got one too. And I talked about how this isn't the reality, but it reflects the reality. It doesn't make me married, but it's a symbol of my marriage to her. If I take this off, it doesn't mean that I'm not married anymore, but I wear it because it's a symbol of my love for her. And it says something unique on here. If you were to read the words, it says this. It says, she is mine and I am hers. That's a promise of exclusivity. That means that my heart doesn't belong to her or to her or to her or to him or to him or whatever it is. My heart is solely given to this beautiful lady right here on the front row. Every part of me. And the same from her back to me. And God says, this is your identity. You are called to be a holy people. You are called to be set apart. You are called to, 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 to bring salvation to the world. But you cannot do that if you're mixed into the world. And Ezra says, separate yourself from me and come apart. As difficult as that is, I believe it was difficult for the heart of God. I do. I believe that God, God probably wept over this to see these families separated, but God knew that everything was at stake here, that the salvation of the world was at stake here, and God says, okay, for the salvation of the world, I've got to have a line in the sand that says you are mine exclusively with no compromise. And so Ezra does that with pain in his heart. He comes and he says, separate yourself from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. 
and the people do this. Verse 16, the exiles did as was proposed. Ezra the priest selected men who were family heads, one from each family division, all of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to investigate the cases, and by the first day of the first month, they finished dealing with all the men who had married foreign women. And then he begins naming names. Oh, y'all, come on. This is a list of shame. And the book ends this way. All of these had married foreign women, and some of them had children by these wives. That's a difficult place to end, isn't it? I'd like to end on something that's all about celebration and the temple and the glory coming, right? I wish I could change the ending of that. Well, you know, Nehemiah is part of that story as well. But it does no good to bring people back physically if they are not brought back spiritually. Amen. It's useless to rebuild the temple if the people are living bifurcated lives, worshiping on Sunday, living like the world on Monday. Mm -hmm. Holiness is essential. And so the book of Ezra comes to an end, and some things I'm processing. Brian, come on up. I want to make these, I want to move through these sort of five takeaways very quickly in this. Five lessons that I want to, to plant in my heart. What does this mean? First one is this. God keeps his promises despite our faithlessness. God is a promise keeper. He will accomplish what he has promised to do in your life. What he's promised to do through his church, he will accomplish it. Even when we're unfaithful, God's faithful. Even when we take off our ring, hide it in the bedside table so we can go do what we want to do on Friday night, God's not that way. When God calls us to move, here's the second point. When God calls us to move, he gives the power and the provision to do so. When he calls us to move in obedience, he provides everything we need to do so. He's walking with us. And that place he's calling us into is a place of absolute love and worship. That's why I love the story about the altar being built first. That's what God's calling us into. He's not calling us into this rigid sort of exercise of this empty law. He's calling us into worship and intimacy with himself. He's calling us into a family. He's calling us into his kingdom. And when, when oppression comes, another lesson, when oppression comes, persevere, stick with it. God turns trials into gold. Stick with it. And finally, through it all, don't forget your identity. This whole series is about identity. We're gonna be talking so much about this identity issue in the weeks and months to come, because it's a, it's a theme that the Lord's been bringing back to my mind. It's essential that we understand who we are as children of God, as the Church of Jesus Christ. Not, not a list of doctrines, <clears throat> values, but our identity. Who are we? Because the answer to that determines everything else. It determines how we live. It determines what we pursue. It determines what we do in the days to come. It determines what we give our life to. Stand up with me if you would. I want to pray for us. And we'll move into some ministry time here. instructions to that now. We serve by intinction, which means you can, after I give instructions here, you, you can come up and take a piece of this bread and dip it into the cup. 
don't pick the cup up and drink it. Bad during flu season. Just dip a piece into the cup and then take it that way as well. The communion table is open to anyone who is coming to the Father with an open heart, desiring to be reconciled again. During communion, when we start worshiping, um, you're free to come up and take communion at your convenience, whenever you want. Um, just you're going to come this way, and I was kind of ask. There's really not a good way to get around this there. All right, well, just be sensitive to who's behind you and around you. That's all I can say. We're kind of crowded. All right. We pray for us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Would you remind us again of who we are in you? It's not that we've forgotten. Maybe some of us have forgotten. Maybe some of us haven't experienced it. But we love to hear your voice to our hearts telling us who we are. That we are your treasured possession. That we are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation chosen by you, adopted by you, bought with your blood, filled with your spirit, sons of the Most High God, daughters of the Most High God. Lord, that changes everything. So Father, just release measures, a greater measure this awareness in our hearts this morning. Let me give this challenge too. Maybe there's somebody here that just that's, that's never established that identity question. Really, who am I? Maybe you've sort of been on the sidelines of the whole Christian faith thing and you've watched it and you've watched friends and family and you know, observed and just said, eh, that's not for me. Maybe this is your day to get up off the bench and get in the game. Maybe it's your day to say, my identity changes today. My spiritual DNA changes now. That's possible through receiving Jesus Christ and his atoning death and the filling of the Holy Spirit. We'd love to pray with you about that. Any of us up here with a name tag, anybody that has a name tag will do it. We can pray with you about that. We can lay our hands on you. If there's a physical need, we want to pray for that as well. We'd love to see healings happen. If you've got a, a, something going on, I'd ask you to just during our, during our music time here in a moment, you would just come and sit on the front row if you need prayer for something, and we'll be glad to pray for you. God's restoring. He's in the restoring business, making new things. sing, Brian. You guys come, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take communion as you can. If you need prayer, then just come and sit on the front row, and we'll, we'll be glad to pray with you. <coughs>